This edition of Black Nouveau contains a segment from the Finding Work Initiative, supported in part by grants from Goodwill Industries and Manpower. African American community, if it was its own nation, would be one of the five highest HIV infected nations of the world, if it was just its own nation inside of itself. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Colas. We're glad you could join us. Tomorrow is World AIDS Day, and we'll have team coverage on the impact of the disease in our community. We'll hear from choreographer Darrell Grand Moultrie, whose work was recently seen at the Milwaukee Ballet. And we'll interview Jack Norman, who believes the rich should be taxed more to help bring jobs into the community. But first, we begin with the HIV crisis. African Americans face the most severe burden of HIV AIDS in the United States. In 2009, we accounted for 44% of the new HIV cases, despite being only 14% of the population. HIV prevention counselors say much of the problem is denial. We do not want to face the issues involved with the disease. Liddy Collins introduces us to an author whose book gets to the heart of the problem. I went to the real tech, as everybody calls it, and then I... Author and Bradley Tech High School grad Shanita Kraut Marks finds that a lot of churches don't address the physical health of its members. She said they talk about the spiritual and might talk about the mental, but the physical health is left unattended to. So Marks addresses them in her novels, of which one is entitled, Is In My Blood. Your book, It's In My Blood, is about what? It's about a young lady with HIV who returns home to deal with the fact that she is pregnant and HIV positive. It's about HIV awareness and the way that the church or the body of Christ is or isn't addressing it. It was inspired by my friend. Um, he died of full-blown AIDS and no one at our church, but a few of us knew that he had that condition because he was ashamed. He didn't feel like the church would respond in love to him. And that really just bothered me and it kind of planted the seed for the story. and. Of course, I started researching and checking into what was being done in the faith-based community, and I just felt the need to tell the story. Instead of writing something nonfiction, I felt like people could feel it more if they saw how it affected a family when someone gets diagnosed with HIV. Why this subject matter? African-American women between the ages of 18 and 25 are right now the highest rate of new infection, and they have been for about the last 10 years. I found out that young ladies who have been sexually molested or assaulted are two to three times more likely to contract HIV. And that really hit home for me because of my background. And um, I just found out that the African-American community here recently, they released a study um, that the African-American community, if it was its own nation, would be one of the five highest HIV infected nations of the world if it was just its own nation inside of itself. So I was just really shocked. and concerned because it's not a lot being said about it. Like in the 80s, there was this big push, get tested, no. And it's, it's almost like it's being swept under the rug or people are just expecting people to know better. And they're not because if they were, the infection rate wouldn't be as high as it is right now. What do you hope people or your readers get out of this book? Two things I want people to take away from It's In My Blood. One is that you can make a difference. Um, when you find out someone has HIV, still touch them, still hug them, still love them, treat them like they're still a person, you know. Um, that in and of itself does a lot for someone who has HIV. The other thing is I want them to be inspired to take some kind of action. Um, talk to their friends and their community about getting tested. Talk to their church about starting some kind of ministry inside of the church for people who have HIV and just do something, you know, even if it's just them getting tested. I have had several readers that said they went and got tested after reading the book because they just hadn't done it and they hadn't thought, you know, that they needed to. But even if that's all you do, you know, just do something to help with having knowledge of what your status is and others as well. What should people do, the first step they should do to get involved with the HIV AIDS landscape? The first thing anybody and everybody should do is get tested. Um, you can get a test for free. If you have a, a cell phone, you can text. Um, you can go online. You can um, text nohiv.org 
and it'll give you a number to text and they'll tell you where your closest HIV clinic is so that you can get tested for free. So the first thing I tell everybody to do is get tested. The second thing I tell everybody to do is wear protection. Um, they have female protection and they have male protection. And yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I know abstinence is 100%, but truth and reality are two different things. People are having sex in the church and outside of the church. And I say, if you just can't stop, then at least be protected. Anyone who's looking for information about my book can go to my website. It's www.shawneda.com. That's S-H-A-W-N-E-D-A. -E I'm also on Twitter at Shawneda. I'm on Facebook. If there is a social network, I'm on it. <laughs> And I'm on it on my phone, so I'm, I'm very approachable. And I love going to book clubs, coming to libraries, doing readings, writers' workshops, everything. So just want to help spread the word about awareness. In the fight against HIV and AIDS, it's better to know your status than to not know your status, which is why today I'm at the Black Health Coalition of Wisconsin to take the HIV test. Welcome to the Black Health Coalition of Wisconsin. Thank you. I understand the you test is free HIV. and doesn't take long. Okay. It can be done anonymously or confidentially. But the choice is still up to you. Which one would you prefer, an anonymous or a confidential? Uh, let's go with uh, confidential. Okay, confidential, thank you. I'm glad you chose that because then if you forget about the test, we're able to contact you and let you know that uh, you need to come back for your result, okay? Uh, first of all, I need you to sign here. Thank you. So that allows us to give us permission to test this. So what we're doing is we're taking the oral swab test. There we go. We just ask you to take that, place that inside your mouth, take that face, that, that white swab, okay. face down on the outside of your teeth. Right. Yes, between your cheek and, there you go. Okay. You can close that. And now we can proceed to ask the, uh, the other parts of this test. While the test is being administered, you do have to answer some personal questions to assess your risk. Once done, it will take about a week to get the results. You have just been tested for HIV. This vial will go to the state lab in Madison. It should take about a week for it to come back to me. So what I want to do now is set up an appointment with you to have you come back or at least call me in a week just to make sure that the result is here, okay? You have to come back to get the actual results of the test. And joining me now is Jim Addison, coordinator for the HIV AIDS services at the Black Health Coalition of Wisconsin and the administrator of the HIV test you just witnessed. Mr. Addison, welcome, sir. Thanks for having me. Mr. Addison, why do you require people to come into your office to get the results of their test? Well, uh, first of all, by law, you can't really give a re HIV result over the phone, and it also re uh, gives us a chance to do some counseling uh, based upon what we, what we might have found out during that questionnaire portion of it. Because what we try to do during an HIV test is not just test. We try to do counseling, hmm. HIV education. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to cover during that time with the person. Holistic approach. Holistic approach. What happens if the test comes back positive? Uh, what I try to do is, is I try to kind of gauge where the person's risk is prior to uh, the test coming back and I ask them, you know, if this test comes back positive, what, what you gonna do? You gonna let me help you? So I try to bridge the conversation beforehand. And so now if a test does come back positive, before that individual comes back to get the results, I'm trying to set up referrals, I'm mm -hmm. trying to set up medical care, I'm trying to get people that that person is gonna go, end up going to see. I'm trying to get all those appointments lined up so that when they come back, if I have to take them myself, I take them to that next appointment. So it's a, it's, you know, it's a lot of touching bases and a lot of collaboration that goes in with a positive result. I would assume that psychological help is also offered because that can be, it has to be devastating. Yes, if needed. Uh, you know, the uh, agencies that we collaborate with, when they go in, they do an assessment okay. of the person. You know, they find out where, you know, the needs are. They try to meet those okay. needs. Do people have to make an appointment or can they just drop in? Uh, we would prefer an appointment, of course, but we're not going to turn anybody away. If I'm there and somebody comes in looking for a test or one of my staff, then we will actually perform that test. Okay. But for more convenience for the person coming in, of course, it's better to make an appointment. Okay. Now, testing isn't only done in the office, isn't it? No. Okay. We also do testing at three church sites in the uh, Milwaukee area, which I can give, you know, if persons call in to ask me that. And, you know, that those tests are also 
uh, done in an area where there's some privacy allowed for the line of questioning that is asked, because there's some personal questions that are asked during that for us to assess the person's risk, whether it be low risk, moderate, or high risk. What has been the response of the religious community uh, uh, to testing? I know you mentioned you're in three mm -hmm. churches, but overall. Well, initially, we started about five or six years ago. Initially, there was a little resistance, not just from the church community, because the people just couldn't fathom HIV testing being done in the church. But over time, when they saw how we've done it, uh, we, were, we respect the, the houses that we're in, mm -hmm. and uh, over time, it's just become a normal part of the services provided in those churches. Okay. Now, HIV is a disease that people don't have to catch. So why are the numbers increasing? Wow. We don't have enough time for that question. Uh, it's just going part and, part and parcel with a lot of the other things that are going on in the African American community. Uh, we, we really need a holistic community approach. It can't just be HIV agencies dealing with it. It's got to be church, it's got to be mamas, grandmamas, you know, anybody that comes in contact with people. Some kind of conversation has to be had mm. about HIV okay. if we're going to see any difference. Where is this disease spreading most prevalent? Well, right now, and I, and I, and I answer this question cautiously because whenever mm -hmm. we pinpoint one population, it kind of makes everybody else kind of unsuspecting. But right now, the, uh, the prevalence is within the uh, men who have sex with men community, particularly from the ages of 14 to about 29. It's about 158 percent increase from about 2007 or so. Now this disease is also having a tremendous impact on African American women as well, correct? Yes it is. It's having a tremendous impact. Why is that? Well, uh, African American women, once again one of those questions that's really hard to get one answer for, but African American women uh, really play a tremendous role in our community and it just turns out that their health is kind of on the back burner when it comes down to the many of the things that they do in our lives. Okay. So by the time they go and get themselves checked out, uh, and really think about themselves, it's almost kind of okay. kind of too late. So it's economic, it's just a whole myriad of briefly. issues. Briefly, briefly. How do we get a handle on this? Talk about it. Talk about it. Everybody, talk about it. Okay. If people want more information, how can they go about getting it? Well, they can reach me at 933-0064 or we have a website, www.bhcw.org. Mr. Addison, thank you so much My for pleasure. joining us on such My an pleasure. important topic. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Earlier this year, the Milwaukee Ballet brought Darrell Graham Maltry to town to choreograph one of the ballets for their production of three. Our Everett Marshburn had an opportunity to get an interview with the award-winning choreographer. So you're here, sha. There you go. Yeah, and usually let's work this way. He can get higher, because yesterday you did it once where it, he gets nice and high. Am I jumping too far? Right. One. You're watching a rehearsal for the Milwaukee Ballet's new program of three original works by three cutting-edge choreographers. This piece is being choreographed by native New Yorker Darrell Grand Moultrie, a 2000 graduate of Juilliard. Moultrie knew he was destined to be a choreographer at an early age. I first knew dance was in my soul when I was very little. I used to, there was a song called Funky Town. I don't know if you know this song. Won't you take me to Funky Town? <laughs> my mother used to have the record of it. I used to dance in the living room. But I really knew when um, I'm born and raised in the projects in Harlem, and I would make up dances in the house and get the kids who were like the most talented or who could dance and create dances in my living room. And the kids who couldn't dance, I would make them be the audience in the small hallways, line them up, then we'd come out my door and put, put the music on and like do dances that I created with my cousins or my friends or the neighbors. Uh, and that's when, I mean, I knew I've been creating dance from a very early age. I know it's a gift from God because what I do is I, um, I listen to my music always thoroughly and then the ideas just start to kind of pour out and as I'm creating I may work on something and go back look at it on video change it but all my ideas I like them to be organic and um, tailor-made for the dancer so if I'm working with you it's tailor-made for your body so that it feels right I don't want it always to feel perfect but I want to make sure it feels organic to the way you move this is his second time working for the Milwaukee Ballet he is much in demand as a choreographer, teacher, and performer 
I was in, uh, I started out doing musical theater when I was young in Harlem and kept going with that. Um, and I ended up doing Hairspray on Broadway and Aida on Broadway and I took a break. And then a friend of mine persuaded me to go to an audition for Little Mermaid, actually. And I was like, ah, and I ended up going and the casting director for Billy Elliot, the musical, was there. She said, you'd be great for that. So I thought, no, I don't want to do that. I didn't, I didn't really know what it was about. And she said, I'll give you a private audition. So she had me come in with the creative team, the director, the choreographer, the assistant choreographer, um, and I auditioned all alone. I had to learn all the choreography, learn, sing for them. Um, and it was one of the best experiences I've had on Broadway. It was a great, great experience. Uh, the kids worked so hard. Um, very great show about dance and males being a male in the dance world and having to get around all the, the uh, adversity and just chasing your dream, you know, and I think it's great for all kids and uh, parents of artistic children. Moultrie has strong feelings about the need for children to be able to freely express their artistic abilities. It's something when, especially as a male, to start taking dance classes or start anything artistic when you, from the inner city, I can only speak from my experience, you are going against the norm. You know, you're not, you're not hanging out, you're not going to the basketball team, you're not going to the football team. Uh, so that adversity, and I think I've had a lot of people who teased me when I was young, now will stop me and say, thank God you kept doing what you did. Uh, and that, because that adversity could be, it could be paralyzing. A lot of people stop their dreams from just what other people say, teasing. And a lot of times it's, you know, I try to push my kids, my young males and females in the arts, that no matter what, you gotta keep going. was very supportive. Uh, my father passed away when I was young, but I will say this, arts in the schools, so important. That was huge for me because I had an elementary school teacher who saw me and said, there's something about you that is special. And if you continue to get good grades, I will help your mother pay for anything you do artistically. And to this day, she's still in my life. She's 89 and she's still, now she's like asking me about my 401k. You know, so she's still, my third grade teacher is still in my life, and I think it's, in a public school in Harlem, I was exposed to the arts, you know, so I think it's very important. He hopes attendees come away with a better appreciation for dance. I want them to have a new appreci appreciation for ballet, a new appreciation for dance, uh, and I want to open them up to uh, the idea that dance can move you, dance can excite you. Uh, uh, and, and in this case, specifically ballet, it can excite you. There is an exciting element to it. Um, and I want them to, a lot of times I really like audiences to come out feeling energized, feeling like they could have got up there and do it or they want to get up there and do it. Because I think that side of dance is dying. You know, a lot of dance is so personal and you know, I like it to just connect to the people. I think with ballet and with dance, a lot of times, if it's not connected to what we know culturally, we turn our heads to it. And I think it's so important to, as soon as you say, nah, I don't wanna do that, I ain't going there, I don't wanna, no. Stop and go do it. And even if you end up hating it, at least you gave yourself that opportunity, whether it's ballet, jazz, classical music, bluegrass music, uh, folk you know, any kind of music or artistic things, try to push the kids to do everything. Here is the official call that I will present to our new leaders of the State Assembly and State Senate. We will present a bold set of reforms help, help aimed at helping businesses create jobs. Most if not all of Governor Scott Walker's efforts at providing jobs are based on the trickle-down theory. Cut taxes, help the rich, and they will provide jobs. Our guest has a different theory. Jack Norman spoke recently at MATC and proposes that taxing the rich means jobs for the unemployed. Mr. Norman, welcome to, welcome to Black Nouveau, sir. Glad to be here. Mr. Norman, how does taxing the rich help the unemployed? If it's done right, it's hardly an original idea with me, but jobs now 
that's what Milwaukee, Wisconsin, America needs. So the based, simplest way for that to happen is for the government, federal government, state government, to put money into job creating projects, infrastructure is the broad word we use to describe everything from improving highways, telecommunication, making homes in Milwaukee more energy efficient. It's a very straightforward equation. Spend money, hire people, put them back to work. Where do we get the money to do that? We tax the rich. That's the formula. So what you're basically arguing is if we tax the rich and do all of the things that you just mentioned, we're going to create jobs. Absolutely. We can start creating jobs almost immediately. All sorts of things. The, the, the projects are ready to go. The objections to it are, well, taxes are too high. I mean, there's a, a lot of resistance to this idea. It's a common sense idea. And I, what I would mainly argue is that most of what the politicians tell us about taxes just isn't true. Briefly, you mentioned the jobs are ready to go. We've already had these she supposedly shovel-ready jobs that did not occur. What makes you think this will be different? The first time around, that happened right after Obama became president, and he, with Congress, passed a stimulus bill mm -hmm. to do exactly mm -hmm. this. The only problem with it, it was too small. Okay, too small. We lost a trillion and a half dollars out of our economy because of the crash. The stimulus bill put back about $300 billion a year, one-fifth of what we lost. So the only reason it didn't really solve the issue is it just wasn't okay. big enough. Okay. Now, you've been a journalist specializing in business and economic matters. What brought you to this theory of taxing the rich, create jobs for those unemployed? Well, it's a widespread theory among lots and lots of people, people in the public, economists, who understand that it's one of the functions of government to step in when the private sector isn't doing what okay. we need it to do. Okay. I don't blame individual companies because if there's not enough demand for their products, mm -hmm. they aren't going to hire people. Okay. It's why the government has got to come in and put people to work and that in turn will create demand and then we'll have the private employers beginning to ramp up. Briefly, I'm a realist. That sounds good in theory, but can you offer any empirical evidence to support what you're saying? Absolutely. There's loads and loads of studies. For example, you put a billion dollars into improving water systems, and that's going to create 18, okay. 19,000 jobs. And we can see this happening all over. Now, also, there are a number of rich and affluent people who agree with you. Absolutely. What is the hang up in getting this approach accepted? Once mm -hmm. again, briefly. Lots and lots of rich people do this. It's politics. It's a small core of politicians, both in Madison and, and in, Wisconsin, in uh, Washington, mm -hmm. affiliated in the Republican Party, not all Republicans, but they are absolutely refusing to let any of this legislation go through. But for the sake of obje objectivity now, they're Democrats in, in that process as well. Ex absolutely okay. right. There's a reluctance on the part of politicians on both sides to even talk about raising taxes, even though every public opinion poll I've seen this year says, well over 60% of Americans agree that taxing the rich is the proper economic policy. Now, your view flies in the face of those who are in power in Madison. So what needs to happen for this theory to be put into practice? Get rid of the people in Madison. It's a very simple <laughs> matter. That's how we do uh, politics in this country. If you get elected, you put your policies in, and in this current situation, we have a governor whose policies are exactly the wrong thing. He's been cutting spend spending. He's been taking back pay that public workers have, shutting down a lot of, of operations. What he's doing is taking jobs out of the economy. It's exactly the wrong thing to do. Best step, simply replace him. Once again, uh, I think you were talking not only about replacing the governor, but those who are in power in Madison. But once again, sounds good in theory. But as you know, at different districts, you have different political environments. So how can you go about replacing enough people to put your theory into action? Once again, I got a limited amount of time, briefly. It's, that's the political process we live in in this country, and it's up to people to put pressure on legislators and make these kinds of changes. 
Campaign finance reform would be a wonderful aid in trying to do this because the biggest obstacle is all of the campaign money that flows and then the legislators are looking to do favors for the people that donated the money. So I think part and parcel of this is some major change in how our campaigns are funded. I have a short amount of time, two more issues. I want to play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Why should you tax me to create jobs for those who are unemployed when I can take my jobs offshore or get tax credits to protect myself briefly? Taxes in America are low compared with taxes in other capitalist countries. Taxes in America today are lower than they've been in 60 years. Taxes in Wisconsin are lower today than they were 10 years ago. We have pushed taxes down. Politicians of both parties have done that to curry favor. There is plenty of room for some increase with people of wealth and, and high income. Mr. Norman, if people want more information, how can they go about getting it, sir? I'm with the Institute for Wisconsin's Future and our website, www.wisconsinsfuture.org. Wisconsin's Future with an S, no apostrophe. Mr. Norman, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me. And that wraps up this edition of Black Nouveau. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night. This edition of Black Nouveau contained a segment from the Finding Work Initiative, supported in part by grants from Goodwill Industries and Manpower.